It is Tuesday, August 27th, 2013, and this is another episode of Athletics Talk Now. This is podcast number 117. We want to welcome you, Ace fans across the globe, listening on YouTube, iTunes, Facebook, and our website, which is athleticstalknow.com. We're a podcast and blog that celebrates the past and embraces the future of Ace Baseball. For Facebook users, we want to encourage you to like our Facebook page. It's at Ace Talk Now. And on Twitter, I'm at, at Dale Tafoya. That's at D A L E T A F O Y A. And on this date in Ace history, 82782, Ricky Henderson, swipe number 119 in Milwaukee, breaking Lou Brock's single season record in the third inning. Ricky worked a two out walk and swiped second base off catcher Ted Simmons. And a record-breaking ceremony ensued at home plate with Lou Brock in the house. Interesting note about the record. This was August 27th. There was over a month left in the season. The A's fell to the Brewers 5-4. to four And A's Hall of Fame closer Raleigh Fingers, interestingly, saving games for the Brewers at the time, recorded his 29th save of the season. And joining me on today's podcast is a former teammate of Ricky Mike Davis had a 10-year career in the big leagues, mostly with the A's. In 1985, Mike hit 24 home runs and had an on-base percentage of, percentage of 348 that season as well. He was number 16 for the A's. And Mike, first off, thanks for joining me on the show. And, and talk about the Hall of Fame career of Ricky Henderson and why aren't players stealing 60, 70, 80 bases anymore? Oh, hey, man, Dell, it's a pleasure being here, man. Um, Ricky was an absolutely great, great player. But since since the days of Ricky Henderson, the game has changed quite a bit. Um, nowadays, you have, uh, you have coaches on first base with the stopwatch, and they have taught the pitchers a slide step to home plate to try to shut down the running game. So they... They do it with the slide step. If I can get the ball to the plate under two seconds and I can get a catcher that can get it, get the ball from once it hits his glove to the, to the bag at second base under two seconds, you pretty much can stop a running game. And so um, the game has changed in that, with that facet. Wow. Let's talk about your career, Mike. Uh, you made your Major League debut with the A's at the age of 20. Talk about what it was like to be a member of the Oakland A's in 1980. Charlie Finley still owned the team that season. Uh, the orange seats at the Coliseum, the bleachers, Billy Martin, and all that. <laughs> now you're taking me way back. That, that <laughs> was an about. absolutely great time. I was... Um, even making the team that year, I, I think we had a real short strike to start the 1980 season, and I was so surprised to found because I had went home for a few days out of spring training because of the strike, and it was just uh, an absolute joy for a 20-year-old to find out that he had made a major league ball club, and at the same time playing for Billy Martin of all people, and so. Um, it, it was it was exciting. It, it, everybody knew about the Billy's history with the uh, with the Yankees, and um, he came into spring training that year, teaching us how to be confident in our ability to compete at the major league level. Um, I'm not sure if you remember Dell the year before. I believe the A's had lost 108 games. Sure. And so um, they brought in a new coach, and, and it, with the emergence of Ricky Henderson and Dwayne Murphy and Tony Armas in a pitching staff that had set new records in complete games that year, it was, it, it was a great transition for me. And it's interesting because when Billy Martin came from the Yankees over to the A's, there was a lot of Yankee Yankee fingerprints on the Oakland A's because he brought over Cleet Boyer. I believe believe he brought yeah. over Jackie Moore, the third base coach. How did you see that yeah. transition and the influence the Yankees had on that those early '80s teams when Billy Martin under the helm? You know the the thing I I that I, that stood out that first spring training with Billy Martin and yes he he had Cleet Boyer. He had, uh, I think it was Jim Spencer who came over playing a little first base and Fred Stanley who came over playing a little shortstop for us. 
And um, I, I guess later on, Cliff Johnson made his way over to the A's as well. But the one thing, what he did in, in, in spring training, as you know, those games really don't count towards the season. But when you win those games as a team, it does something different on the inside of, a, of, of each individual player and as the team as a whole. And I, I believe we may have won the Cactus League in 1980. You can do your research and find out. I'm, I'm not sure. I believe we did. But what we did do, I know we competed at the top of the league that year. And for a team that had lost 108 games the previous year to go out and win um, next to your peers, it, it created a confidence in the players that I, I wasn't sure it would, it would have been there had we not went through a spring training the way we did that year. And in the fall of 1980, Mike, uh, Charlie Finley almost sells the team to Marvin Davis, who was going to move the team to Denver. And, of course, we all know Walter A. Haas of Levi Strauss comes in, buys the A's, and keeps them in Oakland. How much, Mike, did you notice some of the impact the new ownership had on this organization? Oh, I, I will tell you, the Haas family, they were absolutely awesome. Um, I, I've been fortunate enough to experience the O'Malley family with the Dodgers who were just first class in everything that they did over there. I believe the Haas family brought that to the Bay area and did everything possible, not only to win the fans over, but to put together a winning team on the field. And I believe with, with the Haas family, they started setting new attendance records there in the Bay area. Sure. Yeah, they did. It was it was phenomenal to be a part of what they were doing during that time. Mm -hmm. And on December 6, 1982, Mike, uh, the A's traded longtime right fielder Tony Armas to the Red Sox for Carney Lansford in a package deal. I'm sure you remember that. You played intermittently from 80 to 82. How much did the Armas trade give you an opportunity to play every day in right field? That, that. Um, I think they made they they may have done that to make room for me to play and to try to increase what they were doing with the team as a whole. Um, I would I would never have been able to to fill a Tony Armas shoes because I think Tony was hitting thirty five to forty home runs a year during that time and was a great commodity to have on anybody's team. I mean Tony. Tony Armas and Dwayne Murphy and those guys, they, they pretty much taught me how to play the game. They took me under their wings and, and, and ran me through every drill that they went through. And they just, they basically um, were grooming me to be a player. And so um, the trade of Tony to Boston, um, it, it, it opened up a door for me to become an everyday player um, in right field for Oakland. And you played a lot of games uh, most of the season, uh, years after that. Did you have a mentor when you were coming up in the, in the early 80s, Mike, that helped you and uh, give you a feel of uh, what the big league, big league life was about? Well, um, you know, in, in, in the early days in the A's organization, they didn't have very many um, coaches. I mean, this is when Charlie was running the team, you either had one or two guys running a minor league team. And so there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of coaching going on, but, but what I can say when I did go into my first uh, major league spring training between Lee walls and the work that he ran his, his major league outfielders through, um, and as the, the the hard work that they put in it, it was the first time I really had seen outfielders take pride at being the best at their position. There was, I mean, each player from Ricky Henderson to Dwayne Murphy to Tony Armas, these guys they took pride in how they charged balls, how they how they uh, uh, went to the wall to catch balls and to keep to keep the double play in order. They did everything hard. And they, uh, uh, again, that was, they were recognized as the best outfield in baseball in the early eighties. And to be a part of that staff and to, to be a part of that outfield team and learn the way that they worked was a part of my development too. So they, those guys played a big part of 
the player that I became. Yeah, Tony LaRusso, Tony, Tony LaRusso, Tony Armas uh, in right field, Dwayne Murphy in center, Ricky Henderson in the left. I mean, talk about one of the great outfield combos in, in history uh, of baseball. And, and in your time with the A's, Mike, you played under four managers, the late Billy Martin, yes. the late Steve Burroughs, Jackie Moore, and Tony LaRusso. Did you have a, a favorite manager and why? Well, I will tell you, which, fits, which is a great segue to a story. Billy was probably one of my favorite managers because mm-hmm. I never played when I, I was, when, I, when I was on the A's and Billy was manager. Um, with Ricky, Tony, and, and Dwayne in the outfield, I was the fourth outfielder, which meant I never got on the field. Mm-hmm. But what would happen, whenever any one of those guys would make a mistake in the outfield, Billy would come and find me wherever I was sitting on the bench and he would chew me out. <laughs> and that's basically how I learned how to, to, to play the outfield. Whatever mistakes they made, um, I'd be on the bench and he'd come find me. And then the next day, Lee Walls would take me out to the outfield and he would work me like a dog on outfield drills. And so, um, during even during the time with Billy Martin, which was really pretty cool, because I, I learned so much from these guys, that, from the Billy Martins to the Tony LaRussas to the um, Tommy Lasordas, every one of those managers, they had good things and they had bad things about them. But the good things you can take and apply to yourself as a coach, as a manager, and the, and the bad things about each one of them, you can discard. So each of those guys played a role in my development as a, as a, as a coach, as a, as a player and all those things. But Billy, I would say would, would probably be my favorite. Mm, and you know, uh, Mike, when I remember Billy ball, the A style of baseball under Billy Martin, I, I think of stolen bases, hit and runs, bunting, starting pitchers, tossing complete games on a regular basis. Uh, in fact, in the strike shortened seasons in, in 1981, the A's won the AL West with that style. What sticks out most about the Billy Ball era of A's baseball? Well, the Billy Ball era of A's baseball, I believe, nobody really knew our roster. Hmm. They didn't. I mean, we had some guys that can do some pretty good stuff, but they were all new to the American League. Um, they had talent. They, they, they weren't, there weren't really any big names on the team. They, at the time, they became big names by what they did. But in the, in the early stages, they weren't big names. Billy prepared and was very calculated at what he did. We did things on the base path, um, counting on the reaction of players that created, that, that created runs and wins for the Oakland A's in critical situations. Hmm. Um, It was the first time I really ran into a manager that prepared every inning, and and I I guess I was still learning the game also, but he knew everything that was going to take place before it happened, and like managers today, they they do on a regular basis. They have their 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 middlemen and their closers, and, and the game has changed to that today. But Billy was prepared for that before they were doing those things. I'm going to name some of your former teammates, Mike, and, and give me some thoughts after I, I name it, name each one, okay? Okay. Let's go with the first one, the controversial controversial Joaquin Andujar. Joaquin Andujar was uh, from the Dominican Republic, fastball pitcher. Everything he threw was hard. He put pressure. He, he could make the ball move in different directions by the pressure he would, he would lead with each finger that he had on, on the ball. It was, really, it was really awesome learning from Joaquin. He was a go-getter. He was a gamer. He was real fiery, and he loved to win. Jose Canseco. Jose Canseco, when I first saw Jose, I thought he was the best player I'd ever seen in the history of the game. He came up to the Oakland A's. He was faster than everybody. He was stronger than everybody and had a better arm than everybody in the outfield. The, the one setback in the early, uh, he was the only guy I saw in the early stages that didn't work. Uh, I mean, he was talented and didn't really want to continue to develop all the skills that he had. But I was, 
I, I, when I first saw him, oh, golly, this guy was the best thing I'd ever seen. What about one of my favorite utility men in, in all of uh, Oakland A's history, Tony Phillips? Tony Phillips was a gym. Tony was a, was a true athlete, not only in baseball, basketball, football. He could do it in every sport possible and um, just was a, a loud laugh, enjoyed life, and um, just had no limitations. And we can't forget about 1984 when Hall of Fame second baseman Joe Morgan joined the A's. What are your thoughts on Joe Morgan when you played with him? <laughs> he truly was a professional. Hall of Famer, professional. Um, was the, the, the style of the Oakland A's was a little uncomfortable for Joe because I think the players, um, especially after he spent the time with the Big Red Machine, been over to, I think, I, I think he was with, went from Houston to the Big Red or Big Red to Houston before ever coming to the A's. And he was, he was closing out his career when he was with Oakland. And they, the team itself respected him so much being from Oakland and things like that, that they used to do jokes that I don't think went over too well with him. They put an old man's chair or a rocking chair in front of his locker and things like that. And he was more serious than the fun group of players that they had on the team yeah. at that time. Sounds like he wasn't having any of that. And uh, Mike, can't let you go without talking about your role in one of the most devastating Oakland A's losses in history. <laughs> Game 1, 1988 World Series. You were a member of the Dodgers at the time. Two outs, ninth inning. The A's are leading 4-3. to three, And Hall of Fame closer Dennis Eckersley is on the mound. Lasorda. Tommy Lasorda taps you to pinch it for Alfredo Griffin. Somehow, you work a walk off Eckersley, who never walks anyone. A two-out walk. Next batter, Kirk Gibson, limps to the plate and hits a walk-off home run. Take it from there, Mike Davis. That was, I tell you what, you know how memorable <laughs> it is. They still talk about it 25, 25 years later, that it, it, that it is still... Um, when you ask somebody where they were at during that time in L.A., they can tell you exactly where they were at. And um, going to the plate against Dennis Eckersley, everybody knew his history. He had set new records in the American League. Uh, I think he had 43 saves, which was a new record at that time. And, and as you just said earlier, he walked nobody. And I knew... I knew when Eck is on the mound, he could pinpoint wherever he wanted to. And so I stepped in the box knowing I was going to get at least one real good pitch to hit. And he threw a fastball down the middle of the plate. And I took my best swing at it. And I fouled it straight back. And I couldn't believe I missed it. And so I, I, Eck, as a pitcher, is an artist. And so... um as we were, we were in a four to three ball game. You start focusing, you get caught up in the moment, and all you're doing is just executing pitch to pitch and 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 minute to minute. And so um, the next four pitches that Eck threw me were about four or five inches off outside. He 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 just pinpointed every one of them where they were off the plate, and just a little bit too much where I couldn't bite after. And so when I got to first base. Dodger Stadium erupted, and I turned and looked back, and there was Kirk Gibson coming up into the batter's box. Vince Scully had painted a picture because Kirk had the, probably had one of his great years with the Dodgers, and when we were in a time where we needed a big hit, he came through for us all year long and was hurt in the championship series against the Mets, and so he was, he was scheduled not to be, be available. And so when he stepped to the plate, all of L.A. erupted. And so as he, as he stepped in the batter's box and took his first swing, you can see he was still hurting pretty bad. And so once he got a couple strikes on him in a, in a, in a one-run game, um, it didn't look like he was going to be – it didn't look like he was going to last up there. So um, as he battled, 
I wanted to get in scoring position so that we could extend the game out and um, ask for a still sign. They gave me a still sign. I was able to get to second base and uh, and and then you know, on a three two count, Kurt hit a pitch that they're still talking about twenty five years later into the right field seats and it oh. gave the LA Dodgers <laughs> some momentum. You know, the ironic thing about that, man, was um, that didn't happen to the A's very much at all. Sure. And I've been a part of a couple of fantasy camps with the Oakland A's and had a chance to talk to the players um, regarding that very moment. And they it, they were like in shock that that happened to them. And the, it, it truly gave the Dodgers momentum to go through the rest of the series. I mean, in 1988... As you know, Mike, Oakland A's were a juggernaut. I mean, Dave Henderson, they Dave were, Parker, Conseco, McGuire, Steinbach, the list went on. They all won over 100 yes. games. They had a 14-game yes. winning streak that year. How did you guys think you had a chance against the 1988 Bash Brothers? You know, if if they didn't run through the, the Boston Red Sox the way they did, we probably wouldn't have, but... Uh, I always attribute it to the fact that they beat the Red Sox so fast that they they had to sit and wait a solid week before any games could be played. And with that with that wait, you, the delay in, in in playing, you're not as sharp as when you're playing on a regular basis. I think we went through a six or seven game series with the Mets. So when we come into the series, our bats are hot and we're ready to we're ready to go to work right away. They're coming off of a week vacation, and they have to work their way into game readiness. So I think that was our advantage at that point. And the voice you're hearing is Mike Davis, former A's outfielder in the 80s for the uh, for under, under several managers, um, Billy Martin, Jackie Moore, Steve Burroughs, Tony La Russa. And, and Mike, uh, I heard you had a recent visit to uh, the A's clubhouse to visit some uh, old former teammates and old coaches. Tell us how was, how that went. I, I had a good time. I don't get up to Oakland as often as I'd like to, but I got a chance to go in and 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 sit down with Mike Mike Gallegos and and Ty Waller for a bit, and and even go across the way and talk to Ron Washington for a bit. And it, it was really good seeing those guys. I those were the two teams that are battling at the top of the American League West. And while I was there, I believe the A's were up two or three games in the West, and um, it looked like they had a, a, a strong grasp on that league because they were they were just mowing down. They were just winning, just winning. Everything it, that it on the surface it looked like that they I thought because I was asking the questions that they'd have this thing locked up and just cruise away the rest of the season. But I, I was told, man, this stuff is hard. This is hard. We're winning. We're winning. We don't know how we're winning sometimes, but we're getting it done. So, um, it's, it's uh, you know, when you're not on the field and you're not watching the team on a daily basis and you don't know what the interior workings are, um, it can be tough. And I believe they have enough pitching to end up on top in the end, though. That's Mike Davis. I'm Dale Tafoya. Thank you for listening, A's fans. And, and Mike, it was great catching up with you. Uh, always been a big fan, and uh, we'll be in touch. All right, Dale. You take care.